Yeah. It looks like we have some music at this time. <laughs>
Uh, our Lord and Savior, who um, of any of us, far greater than any of us, could have certainly said, this isn't fair. Why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to go through this cruelty? Why do I have to go through this mockery? Why do I have to go through this shame? You imagine the creator of the universe hanging in essence naked on the cross, not because of a thing he did, but because of everything that we do. And if there ever could have been a victim, here was a man that was a victim. He was a victim of my sin, of our sin. But yet his prayer here is one that oozes a victory. His very last statement before he prays, as far as we have it recorded for us, is a statement of victory. And what a challenge it is for me, what a challenge it is for all of us, I trust, to be reminded that as a child of God, we are not to be victims. We are to be victors. And uh, these next couple of verses here that I already read give us another, I think, application of what it means to live in victory. Uh, as a review, the first five verses, uh, we can live in victory by understanding glory. The first five verses mention glory repeatedly. We under, need to understand what it means, what glory means, and how that is the ultimate objective. That is our, that should be our heart's cry. And regardless of what I am facing, if the objective is always God's glory, then how can I ever be a victim? It doesn't matter how cruel the world gets. It doesn't matter how cruel or how hard my job gets, our jobs get. It doesn't matter how uh, uneasy our children become <laughs> or uh, uh, how difficult our marriages become or how honoring the neighbors get or you, the list goes on and on and on. Those things don't matter anymore because our objective is one. God's glory. And uh, I need to be a victor in that. I need to be moving forward in that. The next several verses, verses 6 through 10, beginning the, the prayer for his disciples, uh, the living victory by understanding discipleship. Again, knowing our Genesis, the very beginning, our gain and our goal, and knowing that this is a perpetual cycle, as we remember on the outline there, it was three columns uh, for the three points as they rotated through in those verses. Last week, we looked at verses 11 through 13, living the victory by understanding God's work in our hearts. Uh, we are still here. If I'm still here, that means I have still have a purpose. I have a plan. Uh, we are kept. We are kept by our God, and we certainly are blessed. We will able to have the joy of Christ, have the uh, uh, that, that great victory of Christ in our lives. But here this morning, we want to look at the living the victory by understanding holiness. Great discussion, uh, of which we will not take the time to fully develop here this morning. But the concept of the difference between holiness and righteousness. Uh, certainly, if we could draw kind of like the Olympic circles, we just draw two of them. Uh, the overlap of holiness and righteousness is quite extensive. There's quite an overlap between those two words. But there's also a difference in those two words of being holy and being righteous. And uh, it's a like, great, boy, that can really take us down quite the, uh, the rabbit trails in, in working our, our minds and our words through those two differences of holiness and righteousness, of being holy and being righteous. In the Greek, kind of gives us two distinguishing marks. Uh, holiness, uh, the Greek word for that word, hagios, it has that idea of being consecrated, separated. It kind of goes along that aspect of, of that sanctification that we go through really from the moment of our salvation to the moment of our death. And then as we see for all that he is, uh, that aspect of sanctification, of being becoming consecrated, becoming separated, or becoming ultimately what this word means Coming like no one else, coming unique. Uh, and I say that very uh, cautiously, <laughs> as my wife gave yeah, that chuckle. Righteousness, on the other hand, is a, a word in the Greek that is nikaios, and it has that idea of, of, of conformity, of, of becoming like others. So ultimately, these two words, by their very broadest definition, while there is overlap in our understanding of them, holy and righteous, their actual definitions are complete opposites. One means to become like no one else, and that's that one means to be like everybody else. And uh, I, I think it is possible uh, to, by definition, to have righteous actions without a holy heart. But I don't believe it's possible to have a holy heart without righteous actions. We can follow through with that, how that works out. Um, kind of to help me understand the difference, and maybe it'll help you. Holiness seems to be more of a description of the character. Character of God, his character of God would be holy, but ours as well. The sanctification process of me becoming that kind of a character, becoming more like him in my character, who I am, 
Righteousness is more of a description of the action, uh, which we hope is the outward action of that sanctification, the outward action of that holiness. However, it is truly possible to have quote-unquote righteous actions with a very undoubtedly wicked heart. And uh, certainly we all have known those who are not saved who seem to be very good in their actions, very giving, very loving, so to speak. Uh, ultimately, they can be given. They truly cannot truly be loving without Christ. That's ultimately probably an impossibility. Um, but we all know those who are unsaved. We certainly know those who are misled, uh, who have great outward actions, but their actions are almost as if they're confusing the words of righteous actions with the heart of holiness, and they're, they're confusing those two, as if because I'm doing this, I am not holy. And uh, the, the, that, that does not happen as well. Uh, certainly, uh, there are numerous illustrations of those that are um, have some phenomenal outward actions. Uh, I'll say it this way, even among the cult brain, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses certainly show most of us up in their outreach. Uh, they don't know the gospel. They don't understand the gospel. They don't, they don't know Christ. And if they don't know Christ, they cannot know God. Um, but they, they show us up in righteousness in that regard. Uh, certainly the uh, I'm going to show us up <laughs> in righteousness in, in that regard. Now, a conversation that I've had with a couple of them, I've asked them, so can somebody who has a vehicle and has electricity and a telephone can they truly be saved? The answer is no. This is from the ones I've talked to. And uh, so their understanding of the gospel is wrong. They understand Christ, they understand salvation, but they understand it to be, I have to do these righteous things in order to be saved. And if I am not going to do what they are doing, that I cannot be saved, uh, well, then their understanding of that salvation is wrong. But do they not live differently <laughs> than most of the rest of the world, well, at least here in America, I should say, this part of our world. Um, but we have to understand holiness. And this will help us in our uh, uh, victory. It'll help us in living victoriously instead of living as victims. And going back to verse 14, the very first phrase here. I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Now, we have the because. Here's the reason why. Because they are not of the world. But I think those first two phrases go very well hand in hand as well. I have given them thy word. And what was the response to the world because of their reception of the word? The hatred of the world. Several verses we could go to, and we could spend the entire day just focusing on this very first phrase here, verse 14. But it says in James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is what? The enemy of God. Now we know that verse, we've, I'm certain we've heard James 4, 4 being quoted and read. We may know it, but have memorized it ourselves. How many areas of our life have we become like the world? How many areas of our love, of our relationships, of our marriages, of our childbearing, of our, how we work at, how we do our employment, how we interact with our, how much of our lives is nothing different than ultimately than the world? And uh, striving to even, in essence, be like the world. Well, when I strive to be like those around me and uh, live no differently than those around me, then what does it say about who I am? Yes. Now, I don't know that a child of God, truly, truly a child of God can be an enemy of God, but certainly the reality is, is that if I'm an, obviously an adulterer or an adulteress, I'm trying to do both. I'm deceiving myself into thinking I can do both here. I can be a friend of God and a friend of the world, and uh, you can't do that. It doesn't work. First John 2, 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But man, if any man love the world, what does it say? The love of the Father is not in him. Here we have in the very first part of verse 14, I have given them thy word. We have an introduction of the word, the word of truth, that, that after that has been given to us. We, again, my last point from last week is we are blessed. And ultimately, this very first statement shows us again how we are blessed. We have been given the word. 
And it is a blessing that we have. It should not be something that is looked at as, oh, here we go again. What we have here in the written word should be such that we long for, that we treasure, that we see it as truly that a blessing. I have, let me add the word there. I have blessed them with the word. I have blessed them with the truth. I have blessed them with the reality of how they ought to live. And the response of the world is this. They hated them. Why? Because of the receiving of the word, they were no longer of the world. Introduction of the word, word of truth, but we also have resulting response, hatred. How tragic it is when we try, and I know this is human nature. I, I know that this is a struggle, probably for most of us. How tragic it is, though, that when we, we live as such that the even thought of somebody not liking us causes us to figure out how we can change. Uh, it's part of our man pleaser, man pleaser uh, uh, mentality, and, and I think obviously that that, that whole aspect is that certainly a sin in that regard. I said it from my first point here: holy to the truth, understanding the holiness because of the holy to the truth. And we need to understand that if I'm going to hold to the truth, the world is going to hate me. If I'm going to hold to this. The world is going to respond in such a way that there is hatred. And if my life is always about trying to make sure that everybody likes me, if my response is trying to fit in with those around me. If my life is always about uh, conformity as opposed to transformation, transformity, then, then I'm going to always have a problem with this. Holding to the truth. The blessing that God has given to us, the, the reality of the gospel, the reality of his word, and realizing that that means I'm no longer of this world. That doesn't mean of Illinois, it doesn't mean of Tulane, it doesn't mean of the United States of America, that doesn't mean that we aren't to be patriots, so to speak, it doesn't mean they're supposed to be good citizens of, of, of the country that God has blessed us with. Uh, it doesn't mean that, but it means that the, of the pull, of the rationality, of the uh, of, of the intellect, the drive, the goal, the objectives of society are no longer us. And I think we have great power, and I think that power has been given to the body of Christ, to the church, to be able to have a, a, uh, a, a radical impact on society, a radical impact on Tulane, on Star County, on the state of Illinois, if possible, but God is a God of impossibility, some people learn in that as well. Uh, the body of Christ ought to be one of such that is having great impact as citizens of this world, but yet having our focus on the eternity of our home. And uh, what a, a, a challenge that is, but we need to hold forth the truth. We want to understand holiness. I need to understand what I have. I need to cherish it. I need to dig into it. I need to understand the... Uh, it's not just about righteous actions, but it's about a heart that is becoming more like Him. It's not just about trying to do good things, but it's about a heart that is being transformed into His likeness. It's not just trying to outshine the next guy, but about being genuinely one who is becoming, as our name professes, like Christ, a little Christ. And uh, may that, that be our, our, our challenge. Holding the truth. Uh, if you know me, there is... Uh, one thing that I really like for uh, breakfast, uh, Chick-fil-A, what is it, uh, uh, chicken, egg, and cheese biscuits. Not, not their bagel, that just seems weird to me. It's too much, uh, too much earth in it, too much grain, too much whatever. You gotta go with a white biscuit. That, that makes it perfect with the, the cheese, the chicken, egg, you just gotta endure through, but the rest of it, amazing. Um, but I love that. And the first time that I, and I know I've said this before, but the first time I ever had that, uh, it's not even on the menu, but uh, Joe brought me to Chick-fil-A for the first time. And, and uh, life has not been the same since as far as breakfast and beverage go. <laughs> uh, I love, my wife will attest to this, I, I love, in fact, if we have to go to Maranatha, we have to go to Wisconsin, it's always, can we leave early enough to get to Rockford to go to Chick-fil-A before they start serving breakfast? I really don't care for their lunch or their dinner, but breakfast, I'm there. Well, about the time that we went was because it was having a customer appreciation day, and that was after the big, uh, uh, they took a scan in regards to marriage, ultimately against homosexuality, against uh, homosexuality, I'm not going to use the word marriage in that regard, 
God to find marriage, not us, but the union of homosexuality. And uh, Chick-fil-A had made that stand. And uh, they had a customer appreciation day thereafter. And uh, I don't know whose benefit it was for us, because we had great deals, or for them to be reminded that there are, there are still customers, there are still people that like us. And but anyway, we went on that customer appreciation day, and uh, shortly thereafter, um, Chick-fil-A as an organization released a statement, I don't remember the exact words, but basically, we're going to leave politics for the politicians, and we're going to focus on chicken, which I don't think they can. They, they have excelled the chicken better than probably anybody else has excelled chicken. But in my heart, I remember being slightly disappointed and thinking, this, this is not about politics. This is about truth. This is not about what side of the aisle we, we support. This is not about Democrats versus Republicans versus Independent versus Green versus T versus you name what goes on. This is about truth. And, and the very reality is, as Chick-fil-A knows very well now, you hold the truth. What does the world do? It hates. It hates. Now, we aren't to go out and cause trouble. We're not out to go out and cause mischief. We're not trying to strive and do our best to cause hatred towards us. But we need to be reminded is as I live truth, those who don't also claim and hold truth will hate us. And if I'm going to understand what it means to live victoriously, I have to understand the very essence of what it means to be holy. Ultimately, I need to go all the way back to understand what God's holiness is all about. And uh, what a challenge it is. I've given them my word. The world hated them. Because they know we're no longer of this world. And I trust that that is our truth too. We hold so strongly to the truth that come what may, it doesn't matter what the response of the world is. That's not our objective. That's not our reasoning. That's not our focus. Our focus is we have a blessing of God's word in our hearts and our lives, in our hands. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to live it. And yes, those that don't know truth, those that don't have a grasp on truth, may respond in hatred. In fact, they will respond in hatred. But we need to see, keep on holding. We need to keep on holding, holding to that truth. Continuing on in the rest of verse 14. Because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not, this is a rough verse. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Holding to the truth and holding to the preservation. That's not our own preservation. That's not our own doing, but God's doing in our Lives. We're holding to the preservation, not the world's advances. That's what I'm calling it. Uh, the world is advancing in such a way that it's, it's trying to drive out truth. It's trying to drive out Christianity. It's trying to drive out all that pertains to our God. Again, I'm not talking about politicians. I'm not talking about Springfield. I'm not talking about D.C. I'm not talking about presidents or cabinet members or congressmen or women. Uh, I'm talking about, the, again, the, the nature, the, the drive, the objective, the purpose of the mentality of society today. Again, we don't have to go any farther than to be reminded who the prince of this world is. Again, even just that, the, the movie on planet, which I have not yet seen, so I want to go see it. Uh, the very atrocity of even just abortion. And uh, such disregard for life. They have a very large platform, and all the reasons why abortion is should be viable, as their explanation goes. But ultimately, it's an attack on life, and that's a purpose. That is a purpose attack on society from our adversary, an attack on life. Because it was God that gave life. It was a blessing that God created life. And God created life for humanity in a very different way than God created life for all other animal beings. And as we attack human life, isn't it amazing that the very reality of animal life gets elevated? Now that's a tremendous tragedy. We need to hold to the truth. We need to understand what God is doing in our lives, why He is doing it. Again, it's easy for us to become the victims. Oh, another problem. We get whiny. We start complaining. Hey, stop being a victim. Start being a victor. Why? Because of my understanding of holiness. We need to hold the truth. We need to understand what God is doing in preserving us. Again, verse 15 is, is phenomenal. Deliverance is not about, I have that up to you, number one. Deliverance is not about removal. 
You know what human nature is? Deliverance is all about removal. I'm going to deliver somebody, I want to remove them from the problem, right? If someone's in it, I want to get that away from them. I can tell you as a parent, if, if my kids are going through something, you know, if, for instance, they're homeschooled, so this doesn't necessarily apply to them, but they're going to school, and suddenly they come home and say, I don't like going to school because everybody just picks on me for who I am and for what I believe in. What would be dad's response? You're not at school. There's other schools. You don't need to go there. If, as they're starting their first jobs, or, you know, Becky's long boy kids now will start her second year at uh, Rainbow, they come home and say, well, you know, so and so, Becky says, you know, so and so is mocking me every time I go there because I'm a Christian and I go to church on Sundays. You know, there's other yards, though. Their grass broke. <laughs> I'm a city council member. I'm, I'll give them an ordinance violation for letting their grass grow. <laughs> give me that pad of paper. I'm, I'm going to watch it and measure it. No, I'm just kidding. Kaylee comes home, and I, I wouldn't necessarily believe this would happen in Rainbow because they do somewhat have a, a, a Christian background as well. But if she came home and said, you know, that uh, it's just getting, getting too much, and my, they're attacking me. For my Christian stand, I would say, hey, look, there's other jobs. And as a father, my natural response would be a deliverance means I'm going to remove them from. Do everything that I can to remove them from the situation. And then if that's my case as dad, I have to ask myself, what is the case as me? When I face a situation that is less than ideal, what is my response going to be? Probably the same as dad response. There's other jobs. I don't need to work here. I don't need to do this. I don't need to go there. I don't need to shop that. They don't need my money. I don't need to be nice to them. They're, they're gonna, and it, it, we, we have to be honest with ourselves that so many times we look at deliverance as removal. And we say two words. I quit. I quit. Whether it be in our jobs or in our neighbors, we'll move. We don't need this. Our neighbors are going to get on. We can go somewhere else. There's more houses. Uh, our job doesn't like us, we'll go find a different job. Our schools don't like we'll go find a different school. My wife doesn't like I'll go find a different place. No, we have this mentality that I quit. I quit. What is it? I quit? It's a victim. Not a victor. What we should be saying is, I win. God wins. And because he has overcome the world, and greater is he that is, what is it? In me than he that is in the world. Then I win. I win. We shouldn't have this mentality that things are going rough. I quit. Something's not going my way. I quit. Someone's going to be mean to me. I quit. Uh, I don't like what I quit. We, we got to stop the quit mentality because that is the mentality of a victim instead of a mentality of a victor. Now, I have to caution you and say that doesn't mean that you should never quit your job. Uh, there are times that the Lord leads us elsewhere, and I, I understand. There are times that the Lord leads us to move. And I, I understand all those ideas. But when we have a mentality that deliverance is about removal from the problem, we've got the, the reality of deliverance very wrong. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Wait, the world that you just said hates them. Christ has just said the world is going to hate them. Because they're no longer of this world. The last chapter when he's talking to his disciples, he says, Oh, and by the way, they're going to hate you so much, they're going to ridicule you, they're going to imprison you, they're going to even kill you. That world that's going to do that from the last chapter, and his prayer, he says to God the Father, The world hates them because of the word that I gave them. But my prayer for them is this. Don't take them out. Don't take them out of the world. That's just what he's saying. It almost seems cruel and harsh, but what he's saying is, keep them there. Keep them there. My response is, I quit. I don't like this. I don't need this. This is not fair. Why do I have to deal with this? God's, our Lord's response was, no, don't take them out. Leave them there. Leave them there. I pray not that I should take them out of the world, but that they should keep them from the evil. That preservation, the solution is in the keeping, not the removing. The solution is in the keeping. Our Lord's prayer is, don't take them from the problem. Don't have them do a I quit mentality. Don't give them deliverance in that you won't have to deal about this with this anymore. Show them what true deliverance is. 
Leave them there and keep them while they're there. Leave them in the midst of the trial, but in your sovereignty, keep them, preserve them in the midst of that trial. Keep them so that they aren't like the world in the midst of their trial. Keep them so that they keep, number one, holding to the truth in the midst of that trial. Uh, the solution is not removal. The solution is the keeping. My solution might be running, hiding, leaving, quitting, complaining, griping, moaning, whatever it is. But God's solution is, I'm going to keep you right there in that situation. I'm going to leave you in that situation, but I'm going to keep you. Not as in neglect you, but the, quite the contrary. My very hand is always going to be upon you in that situation. Now, honestly, I kind of wish that our Lord would have prayed. As soon as things get rough, just take them. Wouldn't that make life pretty easy for all of us? The moment things get difficult, take them out of it. Take them home. Well, we'd be lined up at the funeral home. I know it's coming soon. <laughs> I'm going to make it easy for you guys. Here I am. Because at any moment now. But that's not the way it is. And our Lord's prayer is, I'm not asking that they be taken away from troubles. And we need to live that way as well. The solution isn't, I quit. The solution is, His glory in the midst of that which I want to quit. Him being honored in the midst of that which I want to be quit. And me even more specifically, His word being lived in the midst of those I quit moments of my life. Now, if we're honest, to live this out means there's going to be a lot of moments when our natural inclination is to say, I quit. But this word says, keep going. Live victoriously. Uh, show forth his glory. Show forth who you are, who we really are in Christ, instead of what our flesh wants to be without Christ. Very quickly, verse 16 then. The last verse here, we need to hold to the example, not to the world's pull. Now, I know the world's love, the world's advance, the world's pull. Those really all go hand in hand, but it's the, the ultimate idea that the world is doing all that it can. Again, not, not the neighbors, not the politicians, not the bosses, not, not all of the people. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. But the whole objective of the world is to pull us away from our God, to pull us away from truth. We need to hold to the truth. That's how... I need to understand holiness, and it, it stems from the word, it stems from the truth. I will not become more like him outside of the truth. I will not become more like him by conforming and giving in and I quitting. I become more like him by conforming and, and being transformed by the truth. Holy to the preservation, reminding myself that when I'm facing the trial, my Lord's objective is not that I be removed from the trial, but that I live victoriously in it. I also need to live out that example. It says, they are not of the world. This is such an easy statement. Such an easy verse. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This simple question, is that the case? Is that the truth? Is that the reality of our lives? If Christ were able to come back here today, and if he were sitting right here on the platform, would he be able to point his finger to me and say, that new sort of guy is not of the world, even as I was not of this world when I was here. Could he do that? Could I live such a life that I could understand that, that if Christ were here, that, that I would cherish the words of him saying to me, to the Heavenly Father, in fact, this again is still in a prayer. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I don't believe that this is all about, again, the righteous actions as much as it is about who we genuinely are in Christ, because of Christ, in the presence of our God, our Heavenly Father. If I am a child of God, I am no longer of this world, to the same extent that He was not of this world. Now I've got a task to live out, <laughs> to fulfill that kind of character, and I certainly I don't know that it would flesh nature that I have that that could ever be accomplished. And I know that Paul, I think that's pretty much what Paul admitted as well. But because of who I have been declared, declared as class one says, I've been declared as holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. It's not because I'm sinless. It's not because I'm perfect. It's not because I'm no longer a sinner. 
As Paul would say, he was the chiefest of sinners. <laughs> but it was Paul's hand that wrote the word under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that said, But yet I am declared holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. I am as much not of this world as he was not of this world. And if I want to understand what it means to live in Christ and say, I'll be the victim, I have to understand the work of holiness in my life. I need to understand God's work of holiness in my life. And uh, that we truly are not of this world. And the bar has been set to the same extent as Christ. Not the same extent as the pastor, the missionary, or the evangelist. Not to the same extent of, of those that have gone before us. But to the same extent as our Lord and Savior. We are not of this world even as he was not of this world. Now I, I can't say that I responded yet without sin as it said Christ responded. This is in the last chapter. But positionally I am not of this world just as he is not of this world. And so I've got to I've got to realize that I've got to live that God, got to kind of claim that as well. Some thoughts I know I'm running a little late here, but here, how well are we doing? Here's just some thoughts that I didn't have room on the screen to, to put in here. How well are we doing? We say this before I ask those questions. I'm, I want to go back, step back again. Our adversary does not know the genuineness of our faith. Our God does. Our adversary does not. Like Job. Remember what Job? What was Satan's expectation with Job? He's not genuine. There's nothing genuine about that guy. You bless him with everything. That's why he is this way. It's because of his environment. that we heard that before. Because of his environment has depicted who he is. His faith. <laughs> Try him, and you'll see how strong his faith is. Our adversary does not know whether or not our faith is genuine. In fact, his understanding is it's not genuine. And if we can follow the example of Job, then his assault upon us is to prove that God is wrong and that our faith is not genuine. And so he's going to fire his darts at us with the purpose of showing to God that I'm not a genuine believer, I'm not a genuine follower, just like his objective was with Job. Like if, if, if he faces enough trials, he will eventually say, I quit. If you make life hard enough, he will eventually say, I quit. If you make things so that it's not so easy for him, he is going to say, I quit. That's what our adversary's objective is, because he can't see hearts like our God can. He's just assuming I'm going through the motions. And his assault is going to be such, like it was for Job, that he's going to do all that he can to show to God that there is still yet no one that walks on this earth that is genuine in their faith. And so the fiery darts begin to throw, or to get, to get thrown our way, to show that we are indeed still of this world. To show that we are not not, I do the double negative there, we are not, not of this world, as Christ was also not of this world. Uh, he, he wants to prove that what has just been prayed by Christ doesn't apply to any of us. So how well are we doing? The priorities of the church today, the priorities of ourselves today, but even the priority of the body of Christ today, are our priorities the world or God's? He fires a dart our way. And it begins to reveal what is most important to us. So the same as what's important to God, or what's important to the world. How are we doing as far as the uh, authority of the church today? And I'm not talking about pastors and deacons and evangelists and missionaries. I'm talking about the Word of God. The authority of the Word of God. Is it the Word of God? Is, is this the authority of our life? Or is it something or someone else? The darts get fired. It's going to prove or attempt to prove that this is not the authority of our life. Well, this is true. I know that it's true. But in this scenario of my life, you know, that doesn't kind of a gray area. I think my situation just kind of fits kind of like in between that line right there where it doesn't actually apply to me. Our episode is going to prove what we view as the authority of our life. So this 
hold to the truth? Or is it me that I want best? How are we doing as far as the power of the church today? We mentioned that in Sunday school. What about the power of the church today? I see this, and when we talk about church, I'm talking about local assemblies in that regard. I see this a lot in local assemblies. The power of the church today doesn't seem to be anymore about the prayer and, and the gospel. It doesn't seem to be the power of the church anymore. Big, powerful churches today have this kind of music. Big, powerful churches today have these kind of ministries. Big, kind of, big powerful churches today have this kind of size. Big, powerful churches today have this and that and the other. And it isn't, unfortunately, about prayer and the very message of the gospel, message of the truth. How are we doing? What about the relevance of the church today? That's a strong one, even in regards to our own hearts and lives. Are we seeking just to fit in? Are we seeking to turn the world upside down? Satan is firing his darts at us to prove to God that his understanding of us is wrong. Just like he did with Job. And if I can fire enough darts their way, they will soon say, I quit. Because of their objective, our adversary says to God the Father, isn't to turn the world upside down, but it's to claim all the benefits that you offer them without any of the sacrifice that we expect of them. Am I turning the world upside down? Or am I just trying to fit in? The status quo. No ripples. It's here. It exist. Have fun. Enjoy life. And then we die. And uh, we move forward. What about the message of the church? I, this is a quote. I don't know who said it, but ages of faith are not marked by dialogue, but by proclamation. Well, how would we like to discuss things today? Let's have a meeting. Let's discuss something. Let's work it through as if we can, if we, if we talk enough, we'll figure out a common ground. <laughs> uh, uh, we have enough dialogue, we can work things out. Now, I say that after I've been dialoguing for probably too long. But if we dialogue, we talk enough, we'll find common ground, we can find commonality, we, 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 we can work this all out as opposed to a proclamation. Again, I'm not picking on Chick fil A, I, I, I'm, I'm not pointing any fingers at them. They have amazing chicken sandwiches for breakfast, I'll say it that way. But what they did was exactly what we were supposed to be doing. Not a dialogue, a proclamation. This is truth. This is truth. Here, well, let's not have a dialogue about this or that. Let's have a proclamation that life is important because God created life. Let's not discuss it, let's proclaim it. But let's have a proclamation that marriage is important because God defined marriage. Well, let's not discuss about whether or not we can include this as marriage or that can be worked out as marriage or if we can just cohabitate and pretend it's marriage. No, God defined it. Let's proclaim this. This is truth. Let's be proclaimers, not dialoguers, but proclaimers. And, and uh, I kind of like that statement the point. I know that can get us in trouble and probably unnecessarily in trouble at times, but ages of faith are not marked by dialogue but by proclamation. How often even the church today as a whole wants to come to some compromise when they should be declaring, thus saith the Lord, and let's live as victors in Him instead of victims to what the world wants us to believe. What does the world wants us to accept? I read somewhere, I, don't, I didn't see it, I didn't write it down, I guess. Here it is. All this is a great revival. I've taken place when the church learned how to proclaim truth. All instances of great revival happen when the church learned how to proclaim truth. Not figure out how to compromise, but simply proclaim this is what God has said. We're going to hold forth. We're not going to be victims here. We're not going to fall to the assaults of, of our adversary, to the uh, alleged assaults of, of flesh and blood around us, but, but we are going to proclaim what God has said. We're going to hold to the truth. And we're going to understand that deliverance is not about, I quit, I don't need to be in here, I, I, I'm giving up. But deliverance is about God's very protection as, he, as we do what he's called us to do. And holding to the example of the very reality that we are not of the world, even as Christ is not of this world. It's an awfully high bar that we've been declared it as such. Maybe live it as such as well. Understanding holiness. It's a great way to be victors instead of victims.
May we be challenged. I know I was challenged, and maybe just the thought of Job. My adversary is going to do all that he can to prove to my God that I'm fake. That if enough comes my way, I will say just two words. I quit. I have a great illustration that really would fit really well right here. But you're going to have to come to the nursery room this afternoon because I didn't even realize the connection there. But it's a great illustration that would be a great closing here. But you're going to have to wait for it. Because we're going to close with the word of prayer now. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for who you are. And I thank you for your word. I pray that we understand that this prayer, the prayer before the cross, was not one of victim status, was not one of I quit. It was not one of this isn't fair. It was not a prayer of how can we get out of this situation. It was a prayer of victory. It was a, a prayer that declared victory. And one that he desired and prayed for victory in our lives as well. And I pray that as we consider life and we consider the decisions we make and we consider our own, uh, where our feet stand, in our homes, in our marriages, in our workplaces, in our communities, with our neighbors, wherever it is, that we'd understand that our adversary is doing all that he can to prove to you that we will quit, that we are not genuine, that if there's enough discomfort, that we will run for the hills. And I pray that we would be ones that would all continuously hold to the truth. Why? Because it's the victor's stand. That we one that will continue to proclaim the truth. Why? Because it's the, vic it's the victor's proclamation. And we thank you for what you will do in and through us as a result. To your honor, to your glory, not to ours, but to yours. We thank you for that opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to stand in closing 476. If you're all on the altar, they go long for a sweet peace and for faith to increase. And have earnestly and fervently prayed, but you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed. Until you understand they're all only be laid on the altar. It's not about us, it's about him. It's about us, I quit. It's about him, I glory in infirmities, Paul said. And let us march forward. 476, you're all on the altar.